Today's message is entitled, I Will Not Be Shaken, and our passage of scripture comes from Psalm 16, 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. God bless the reading of his word. Horatio Spafford was a successful businessman in Chicago in the mid uh, 18, 1800s. He had been blessed with successful career as a lawyer and had turned around and invested that money that he had made in property in and around Chicago. And the future looked very bright for Horatio Spafford. And it seemed to most people that God had smiled on him. He had a wonderful life. He had a wonderful wife. He had a wonderful son and four wonderful and beautiful daughters. He was a devout man and greatly appreciated all that God had blessed him with. But as humans, we've come to understand that the only real constant in our lives besides our all-loving God is the inevitability of change. And in October 1871, a fire broke out in the southwest corner of the city of Chicago. And because of the dry conditions and most of the buildings being wooden structures, the fire quickly spread and it destroyed much of downtown Chicago. It took three days to get that fire under control. And by the time they did get it under control, 3.3 square miles of Chicago had been burned to the ground. The tragedy became known as the Great Chicago Fire. Over 300 people lost their lives in that fire, and much of the prosperity that Horatio Spafford had invested in was now so much ash. And the economic downturn of 1873 as a result of the fire cost him most of his fortune. Now he and his family had planned on taking a vacation at the end of 1873, but due to the circumstances of the fire, he was financially bankrupt, basically. But that wasn't the hardest part. You see, the hardest part was that he had lost his four-year-old son in that fire. Well, rather than cancel that time away, they went ahead and planned to go ahead to Europe. But as uh, life would have it, at the last minute there were some zoning issues with the reconstruction efforts at some of the properties that he had there in Chicago, and, he, and Horatio was unable to leave. So he planned to go ahead and meet his family later as they sailed to Europe on the ship SS Vita Hav. And while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship collided with another vessel and it quickly sank. His wife survived the tragedy and sent a now famous telegram back to her husband that said simply, Saved alone. Horatio Spafford had now lost his four dollars as well as his son. And he also felt that crushing weight of not being able to comfort his wife in this aftermath of this tragedy. He quickly booked passage on another vessel and left to join his grieving wife. As Spafford passed close to the location where his daughters had lost their lives, he penned the words of a famous hymn. Now, Philip Bliss, the famous composer of the time, wrote a hymn that was a meditative tune in, in memory of the stricken vessel of the lost pan, uh, passengers, and they joined the lyrics that uh, Horatio Spafford wrote with this music. The lyrics that uh, Horatio Spafford wrote 
were not angry words spoken to an unjust God. Although many would feel that he had the right to those kinds of feelings. You know, we often feel that if God existed, no one would have to suffer such tragedies in their lives. We cry out asking why a loving God would be so unjust. If he is so unjust, how could he exist? Why would he punish a good man like Horatio Spafford and bring such pain into his life and into the life of his wife? Why would he point his finger in a merciless act of judgment and bring this family to its knees? But those are not the kind of words that Horatio Spafford penned as that vessel was passing near the tragedy that occurred. He could have screamed curses at a vengeful God, although, and nobody at all would have blamed him. But that's not what he said. Instead, these are the words he wrote, words that bring comfort to us today when we face tragedy in our own lives. You're very familiar with these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. O oh, sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. For me be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine. For in death as in life, thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend a song in the night, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Our lives should never be defined by the tragedies that we face. Our lives are not defined by the mountains that we find in our paths and our lives are not uh, defined by the rivers that we have to cross. Our lives are not defined by our health, our finances, our stature, our education, or even our position in life. Our lives are defined by our relationship with our Creator, the one who gives us life and wants so desperately to walk beside us in both our pain and our joy. 
our faith in that same creator cannot be based on our own prosperity. And although we often think of prosperity as a blessing and poverty as a curse, we think about Job and how he understood the concept that our condition in this life has absolutely nothing to do with how much God loves us. Job lost his wife, he lost his children, he lost his home, he lost his health, he lost his land, his animals, his fortune, and everything else that seems to matter to us as human beings. He covered himself with ashes in despair, but he did not, he did not lose his faith. He understood that God's love for him was not demonstrated by his health, his fortune, his family, his land, or his possessions. No matter what happened to him, God was still God. God still loved him, and it was Job's duty to serve him in whatever capacity he could. Even when his closest friends were telling him that he must have done something terrible to displease God, that God would be so angry with him that God must have done but to have taken everything away from him and left him in total misery. And Job, he was not shaken by any of this. Neither was his resolve or his faith. And yes, even though we know and believe that God loves us, it is human nature to feel the misery that accompanies great loss. However, it is also in that place of pain, that condition of loss, that, that emptiness that comes with despair, that can bring us closer to our Heavenly Father as He walks beside us and, yes, even carries us when it is necessary. And we lean into Him for comfort and for strength. It is only in the face of the storm that we realize just how insignificant we are in a universe teeming with life. And yet we understand that God finds us more valuable than any of his other creations. God loves us and values us so much that he sent his only son to die for us so that we can be enjoined in a true relationship with him that wouldn't be possible without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross or the resurrection three days later. God does not bring storms into our lives. Let me, let me repeat that. God does not bring storms into our lives. But, just like in Job's case, he will allow calamity to befall us and then use that calamity to build character into, into us, to teach us how to better both ourselves and those that we serve. God uses the opportunity to draw us close to him as we realize that he is the source of our strength and a secure and warm place for comfort. The author of our psalm today, Psalm 16, is David, and the psalm is called a mictum, meaning the golden psalm. And this is the first mention of the word mictum in the Bible, but several other psalms found later in the book of Psalms are also referred to as mictums. They are meant to be referred to as precious jewels of wisdom and full of insight. Now, we've talked often about David and how in the past and how David is our prime example of how to view our relationship with our Heavenly Father. No matter what we do, where we go, whatever our challenges are and what we face, no matter the giants in our path, no matter what we mess up in our lives, God is at our side and he is the source of our strength and our redemption. David says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
Why is this verse so very important? You know, I talked a little bit on Sunday at the sunrise service about how we can be distracted by life around us. We focus on the problems in our lives and the impossible situations that are out of our control, but we don't focus on the solutions. That's normal. It's our animal instinct. We analyze and we make a decision regarding whether we will address the problem or find the problem so large that we back away from it. The fight or flight response. Often the problem is too big for us to handle. And we look for help. But the problem with that is we should be seeking help not based on the size of the problem. None of us today is capable of solving the current health care crisis. We see depleted bank accounts, lost work, loss of health, separation from our loved ones, forced isolation from our neighbors, and worries about tomorrow and how it will change our relationship and what the world will look like when we get up in the morning. The problem is huge. But we forget that God isn't there just to solve our huge problems. But he's there to help with every aspect of our lives and every problem in our lives. You know, David often shows us that he is human, just like us, by trying to solve his minor problems on his own, which in turn turned into huge problems because he doesn't give them all up to the Lord to begin with. So when he does find clarity, we find him saying, keep, I, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. In other words, if I take my eyes off of the Lord, if I decide to do this on my own, I'm going to be shaken. I'm going to be in trouble. But if I keep my eyes always on the Lord, with him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Our problems, all of our problems, are God's problems. And God's problems, every God's problem, deserves a godly solution. And sometimes we are chosen tools that God uses to implement and work through his plan, even if we don't know what the outcome will be, or we cannot see how we're doing and, and, and what he's asking of us we can't see the results we can't even see if it's going to solve the problem that's in our path i am certainly not talking about throwing up our hands and quitting by telling god that this is a problem and he needs to solve it that's hubris david did not go into battle without his sword and god needs his children to be his sword in the battles that lay before us yes there are mountains to climb and there are rivers to cross, and there are impediments of every kind that strive to keep us from accomplishing God's will, both in our lives and the lives of the people that we serve. But it's all of our problems. It's our minor problems as well as our big problems. We have to stop looking at the mountains and the rivers, and instead, Keep our eyes focused on God, who is the source of our purpose and the provider of our strength and our resources. We're not gathered to complete our plans, but to complete God's plans. If our eyes are focused on him, if we don't waver from our understanding that we are his tools, then we can count on him to be at our right hand. We can count on him to provide the resources we need. We can count on him to be a constant source of everything that we need to accomplish his purpose. We will not be shaken. We cannot be shaken if our eyes are focused on God. There is no storm greater than our God. There is no mountain bigger than our God. There is no river that our God cannot cross. And there is no problem that we face that cannot be overcome by our God. He is our source and our guide. We need to accept that mountain is there because God placed it there. 
And he will move it in his own time or he will give us the strength to climb it. The fourth chapter of Mark talks about Jesus in the boat with his disciples when a great storm came up. Verse 38 through 41 tells us this. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? And he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? This is the nature of our Savior. The wind and the waves obey him. That is who walks by our side. That's who stands in our presence. The power and strength of the creator of all things is our guide, protector, comforter, and source of all that we need. And when David, who knew the pangs of human, of being a human, who understood what it meant to be broken and charred, and a vessel that is, is, is messed up in so many ways, in the presence of all living, loving and gracious God, the creator of the universe, the master potter, spoke with passion. David said, I keep my eyes always on the Lord with him at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Are we finding the ground a little slippery during these times of difficulty? Are we battling loneliness and separation? Are we worried about our families, our jobs, our health, and the health of everyone around us? Are we concerned about what the world will look like tomorrow when we wake up? And do we feel like it is all slipping away, totally out of our control? Listen to David. Listen to his words in Psalm 16. Write them on your heart. Find the value in this victim. Write these words down and repeat them every morning when you first open your eyes. Memorize them and hold them close to you throughout the day. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. We may not be in control, but God is. And he is at our right hand. We will not be shaken. Amen.